good. You need to move this good, good. keyboard, why bro. Do I feel like I'm. Are we not even? Why do I feel like I'm so far over right now? Or the camera is so far over. Am you I need too to move over? over. Yeah, you need to go that way. I'm out of here. Sorry, we gotta like set this all up. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, hanging out with us tonight. Right here. Glad you are chilling. Uh, yeah, maybe. Maybe I just needed to. We're, we're all messed up. We're not centered. It's driving me crazy. Glad you're here. I hope you are centered. I hope you're centered in front of whatever it is you're watching because it's just gonna make, yeah, see, we were. We're still messed up. I'm, I think you gotta move over a little bit more that way. That way again? That way, yeah, get, get, just, just keep going. I'll let you know. <laughs> when we can't see you on this, when we can't see you on the screen anymore, we'll know. Don't bump anything because you're gonna mess up the whole camera situation. Oh gosh, no, that's too far. But Let's not get carried away, Joanna. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We've got things to talk about. We're going to be talking about uh, fish, fish, fish and fish stores. Let me uh, turn your volume up a little bit there just because it seems like that's the thing to do. And I hope you're having a great week. I hope everything is going well for you. And uh, for me, I'm on spring break with the with the youngster. So it's been nice not having to. Must be nice. Yeah, it, it is. It's been nice not <laughs> having to get up early in the morning and do stuff. So that's pretty sweet. But it's rapidly, it's already the middle of spring break. So we're right in the heart of it. But the nice thing is spring break, then we know we're, at least for me in my semester, we're halfway done. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. pretty awesome. So interesting story. Um, tonight, me and Eli, we went out, my, our, our youngest son, and we went to this place, and I got a, what's called the double. And I don't think I read it closely enough. Oh, no. But what it wound up, it was really good. It wound up being a giant Italian sausage sandwich with, coated with big, giant mobs of beef. And I, Portillo's has this thing, but the place we went to, it's like twice as big. Holy cow. It's like... Wow. If I fall asleep in the middle of the stream, you'll know why. Because I have way too much meat. And uh, meat sweats. Do I have water? Yeah, I'm. I, well, there's no doubt about it. I am getting the meat sweats tonight. Like it's 100% guaranteed. It's gonna happen. So tonight we're gonna be talking about the role of the fish store and what fish stores, <laughs> uh, what role they can play and how they can be successful in this year, 2024. It's a subject we've talked about in the past, but it's been a while. And as time goes on, things change. And so I wanted to kind of just, you know, have a conversation and especially kind of see where, where everybody's coming from in terms of where they are getting their fish and how they feel about certain, you know, options and things like that, you know, and we'll be interested to hear your thoughts as well. So, yeah, that's kind of what's going on there. Now, in the land of, as always, as we get started, the land of videos, on Sunday, I did a video, what I thought were the top five schooling fish. If you haven't seen it yet, I hope you'll check it out pretty soon. Now, with this video, what I did is I really tried to focus on fish with the priority being that they school together relatively tightly. I know there's a difference between schooling fish, fish and shoaling fish and I get all that. Maybe I probably should have mentioned that in the video, but I didn't. I just, everybody knows what a schooling fish means. When you start throwing around shoaling fish, I'm sure almost everybody sitting here knows what that means because let's face it, you're hanging out on a fish live stream on a Wednesday night. I have a lot of faith in your knowledge, but I just wanted to keep it simple with simple words. And so that was my, that was my focus on Sunday's video was to make sure that these were fish that if you're buying them because you want to see them swimming around together, that that's what they were going to do. Now, on Monday, and it's funny now because we have three different channels to talk about. On Monday on the Tank Talk podcast, the subject that we talked about there is going to kind of tie into what we're talking about here. So on Monday's Tank Talk podcast YouTube channel that I, that I have with uh, John from KG Tropicals, we talked about how to pick healthy fish. So whether you're going to a fish store or swap or wherever you're going, how to make sure that the fish that you're buying are are worthy of bringing home. And then today on your video, you did on the small scape, a very unique subject. What did you talk about? I also talked about five best plus one schooling fish. I had a plus one too. But that was my, uh, it was my own take. It was your own take. And that's why I, I knew it would be, so 
what I did is I came up with, you know, I was like, I'm going to talk about, you know, some really cool schooling fish. And then we were like, you know, you could do one too on your channel on Wednesday. And the first words out of your mouth, well, what if they're the same? I'm like, I don't think they're going to be. I don't think they're going to be the same. And sure enough, when they you, really weren't. we only had one, for one, one, one over overlap. And we, we're not going to, we're not going to ruin it. No. So people will have no. to figure out what that overlapping fish was. But yeah, I kind of figured that would be the case. And even my, my plus one, when I originally told you, you're like, yeah, I, no, you can't do that. And then you're like, actually, well, that's not really a bad, that's, no, and I think you could. What was also interesting <laughs> is your plus one. A couple people had mentioned that in the comments of my video, so I was like, "Oh, okay, that's that's even more good interesting." For them. So it was a good one. It was a, it was my definitely people. your your plus one, your honorary mention, mm -hmm. honorable mention. I thought was a it was a it was a nice nice way to kind of tie everything together. Thank so you. that was your video I today. Try. Again, go to the Smallscape, check it out if you haven't already done so. Uh, tomorrow we'll have the members video out. Sunday we'll have another cool video out. I have a whole list of options. Wait, it's not this sheet. This sheet right here that I'm really psyched about. So it'll be one of those. That's the plan. Uh, so anyway, that's what's going on in the land of videos. Where we're going to be in the near future. Not this Sunday, because this Sunday is Easter. Happy Easter in case we don't get to see you again uh, before then. But the following Sunday is a dual swap that we're going to be at Quad Cities uh, Swap in Davenport, Iowa. And you're going to be at the Northbrook Swap in... Northbrook, Illinois, the GCCA swap. And I then, am. And then on the 20th of next month, that's a Saturday, we'll be in Tinley Park at the Greenwater swap. That for us gets pretty close to wrapping it up for the swap season. There's a couple other ones that happen in May, but we're going to be in Aquashella, which by the way, Aquashella, Dallas, that is May 18th and 19th. It's really starting to come up. We're starting to get pretty excited about it. Those things always just kind of sneak up on us like yeah oh it's months away it's months away and then all of a sudden it's like oh my gosh Whoa. i was just telling you what yesterday the day before I'm like we have to like figure out our whole planning situation here because it's less than or it's just over what eight weeks or under eight weeks away now so it's coming up curious anybody here going to aquashella dallas uh coming up in in the near future here may like i said 18th and 19th because we're going to be there hope to see you there now the one thing I will say is, like I said, yeah, with the swaps, there's a couple that fall on that weekend. Obviously, we're going to miss that. Then there's a couple in the summer, but they're like the off-season time, and then they really don't pick up again until September. And quite frankly, I'm, I think we're all looking forward to a swap season break, right? Yeah, by the end of swap season, it, it gets a little like... You it get gets to exhausting. Take a, yeah, you kind of like a phew. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, swap season, it's not just about, oh, going to the swaps. I mean, people do that for fun, as we would too, but it's all the prep and picking up the fish and caring for the fish and making sure we don't lose them all and all and, and figuring out what we want to buy and all that kind of stuff. So there's there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that goes into it. It's nice to have that break. It's nice to have the swap season break, get rejuvenated and be ready again for for the fall. So I see some people. Uh, so I see some people are. Hold on. Check it out. Uh, We've got some anniversaries here. I, I thought I saw some anniversaries. And Chattanooga Ed is here. What? Ed. Wait, we've got the power duo here? We do. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Hold on a second. Let me look at my other screen. I don't like this other screen now because no, it doesn't uh, really. Mac, thank you so much for being a member of the last 22 months, for being Thanks, a prime Mac. timer. One more month till a year. Fish wow. room looks super cool. Thank you very much. And thank you for the last 11 months. And then we got Zen. Zen, I saw your comment. Or I saw that you commented and I saw you had the over one year badge or two year badge or whatever it is. I'm like, holy cow, two, yeah. it's been a while too. Uh, hello, J and J, that's you and me. Uh, two years. My how wow. time flies. Hope you're both well. Hope you're doing well too. That's awesome. Thank you for Yippee. hanging out with us. Um, and then I see some people. Some people are going to Aquashella, Dallas. Um, well, of course, second floor. That's their yeah, well, home I would turf. Hope so I mean, yeah, you're you gonna know, be we're right going there. into their turf. Um, William says, hey, I am going, not to Dallas, but going to be at the Chicago one. Chicago is in August, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. I think so. So, yeah, that one I haven't quite Sweet. mentally prepared. Yeah, it's the first weekend in August. That's when it is. So, I lied. I know when it is. It is? Yeah. It is. The first, it's like the fourth or third or fourth or fourth or oh, fifth or whatever it is. Yeah. Which would be the first weekend in August. See how I figured that out all on my own? It's amazing. I'm like calendar man. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. Uh, so 
we do, we are going to be talking about something today, and that is, as I mentioned before, <sighs> the fish store. Your local fish store. Come with us. What role does it play now in 2024? I was thinking about it the other day. I, I was talking to somebody. I, I think it actually, it started when we were doing the podcast, uh, the Tank Talk podcast with John. We were talking about how to pick out healthy fish. And in my mind, I was also thinking about, okay, well, just fish stores in general with everything that's happening, how do they thrive in 2024? Because I think, I hope everybody who's involved in the hobby wants them to thrive, wants the good ones to thrive and succeed. And they are still the backbone, the cornerstone of the hobby. It's, you know, for a lot of people, that's how they get introduced to the hobby is they drive by a pet store or a fish store. They go in and they're like, oh, wow, this is really cool. They get to see a bunch of fish live and in person. And, and I think that's one of the things, and we'll, we'll talk more about you know their, their advantages, but one of the cool things about a fish store is you get to go there and actually see fish. It's, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm hoping a lot of you will agree, but actually going to see fish is a lot better than watching them on a screen. Oh, yeah. Well, I think we could all agree with that, right? Yeah. And you actually learn a lot more about them too when you see them live and in person as opposed to seeing them on a screen. So... Uh, definitely there are advantages there. Uh, so we thank you so much for being a prime timer the last two months. We got so many fish stores in Southern California, but surprisingly there's no fish tubers out here. That is surprising. And hold on, I'm trying to think, is that really the case? Yeah, I guess uh, Zenzo's in Northern California. He's in San Fran. Oh yeah. And then you got all the group in the Northwest, right? Yeah. And then, wow, that that's that's interesting. I, I never really, I don't think I ever really realized that, that that is indeed the case. Uh, Christy, thank you so much for being a prime timer the last 10 months. I've written a few articles for our local fish store and they give us store credit for our mystery snails and surplus quarries. You know what? I, I need to, hold on, I need to write that. I need to write something down here. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, so, challenges with the, with the local fish store. Do you see any challenges that they have? Do you see anything that might be tough for them? Well, they have to make sure that they have fish that people want. They have to make sure that the fish are healthy. Okay. So absolutely. I would say that that is certainly something that they have to ensure that can be a challenge, right? And I, I fish health, fish that people want. Uh, most definitely, two things I definitely want to talk about later on. I would say, what's their main competition at this point? <laughs> swaps. So, abs in our area, for sure, the swaps. And it it's, doesn't go unnoticed to me with the three swaps that we go to that, and, and they're all adding more swaps as time goes on. It used to be, I mean, even as far as uh, probably 2018, 19, you might have in this area, there there might have been like the GCCA swap, I think ran four, maybe five times a year, same with green water. So you'd have 10 total-ish, right? For the entire year. Now in the Chicagoland area, you've got the GCCA that runs six swaps a year. Green water runs 10. And now you've got two others in the Chicagoland area, both also running, I believe, four or five swaps a year, not to mention all the, and that's not counting the Quad City swap. They, they, they just added another one. So I think they're up to six in the Davenport area. Milwaukee has swaps. Indiana has swaps. There used to be one in Southern Illinois and Peoria. So swaps are absolutely a something that is going to compete with the local fish store. And that, that's a tough one for them to compete with because, you know, I look at these swaps and in the Davenport area, you're looking at on, on one of their swaps easily, probably bare minimum, 1,500 people. I've seen those swaps where they claim two or 3,000 have walked through. And I would absolutely believe that based on the number of people that come in there in the first couple of hours. It's a big what is that, like a banquet hall? Yes. They fill a mm -hmm. banquet hall with like with a hundred something vendors yeah. and it is packed shoulder to shoulder in that place for hours. It's free admission. By the way, if you're looking to get into swaps, uh, the Davenport Quad City swap is free admission. Greenwater is free admission. G GCCA is like five bucks to get in, uh, which is 
basically next to nothing c considering the value that you get. But yeah, local fish stores have to compete with all these swaps. And you've got thousands of people going to these swaps in Davenport and, and combined with the Greenwater and GCCA, easily well over a thousand that are walking through those doors. Those were all potential customers that maybe 10 years ago would have gone to the local fish store to buy fish, but now they're going to these swaps primarily because you've got people who are breeding fish, they're selling them for cheaper prices. A lot of vendors there now are importing fish or buying fish wholesale. Sale. Uh, hopefully some of them like we are, we're quarantining these fish for four weeks, something that a pet store would probably never do uh, for understandable reasons. We'll get into that in a minute. So I'm not knocking that. I'm just, it's really hard to take up store space for that long and sit on product that long. So uh, yeah, absolutely the swaps. And then of course the other obvious one, if you're buying something online, uh, <laughs> we're all, it, it's gotten to the point. Now I'm curious if any of you are like this now, I don't know when this happened in my brain, but it did. And I noticed it a few days ago and I was like, Oh wow, that's, that's crazy that I'm like this. If I need something, I go online. I, I don't even think anymore to go to a store. I go online. Yeah. I go to <laughs> Amazon or wherever I buy the stuff from. And I'm like, okay, can I get it tomorrow? <laughs> and here's the dumbest thing. It's like, if I can't get it the next day, I'm like, oh, I got to wait two or three days. And then I still order it. I don't even think. It doesn't even process in my brain. Oh, wait a minute. Get dressed. Get in car. Go to store buy the thing and come home same day. Yeah. I would, it's just, it's dumb. I, I, I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is me being smart. I, I don't know why I do that. And I think maybe I need to get away from doing that. Like, you know, just leave the house, go to the store, get the thing. And you should go to the back. grocery store every once in a while. No, do you, do you, is that really something you want me to do? No, that's true. Can we explain to the family here when, the times where you're like, come to the grocery store with me, and I do, it's extremely rare. What inevitably every single time winds up happening. He always gets, gets or already is very, very hungry, and then he just gets all these random things. And of course, Costco is even wow. worse. Now, I don't really like Costco, just I because love it. everything is just, just so much stuff. So you have yeah. to spend all this time loading in the cart, and then from the cart to the fair, and then to the car. And it's just, and then when you get home, you're like, where are you going to put all this stuff? So it just stresses me out. But he loves Costco. Yeah, I could. And, oh, man. But even like the regular store, like in the Chicagoland area, we've got the Jewels. If you're in the Chicagoland area, yeah. you know it's not Jewel, it's the Jewels. And I'll go there and buy some pop and sit on the couch in the front room, in the front room, and just, you know, chill out. No. But anyway, those are all Chicago terms. Yeah, so online, huge, huge competition there for the local fish store. Yeah. There's two things though, right? I mean, there's the hard goods and then there's the fish. And I am of the opinion that yes, a local fish store is going to have a more difficult time competing with online for the hard goods. Uh, now, let me re rephrase that, for equipment filters, lights, heaters, fish nets, thermometers, that kind of stuff, right? They shouldn't have as hard of a time competing with hardscaping goods, right? Rocks and wood, because that's your, your, you take more of a chance, right? Even if you see something that looks cool, it's like, ooh, this isn't quite as large as I thought it would be, or as small, or the back of this piece of wood doesn't look as I, I thought it would. Plus shipping. Plus the shipping, right? So that's why I, when it comes to two things, when it comes to hardscaping materials, I think the local fish store is still the way to go. I mean, sand and rocks and all that kind of stuff, but also the fish, right? If a local fish store is doing what they're supposed to be doing and they recognize what, what is the fish that are actually selling well and they recognize what their customers want, they should always be able to outcompete online for the fish that they are selling. There's other issues there that we'll get into in a second, but... Uh, that I think that's one of the big things too, is do they have the selection? Because for those of you who have been keeping fish for a long time, how many of you remember the only option you had when you wanted fish was you hopped into the local fish stores and maybe there were a few around you and you would go there and you would just see what they had. And then you would buy the thing that was <laughs> there. closest to what you wanted <laughs> or something that got it, you know, kind of got you excited and would hopefully roughly fit in the aquariums that you had. 
So that was kind of what I remember doing most of my life. And then guess what? We got spoiled. And now I see a cool fish. It could be Amazonas Magazine or somewhere on the internet. I'm like, that's cool. And what's the first thing so many of us do? <laughs> blah, 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 this fish for sale. And now you're trying to find the vendors that have them for sale. So uh, that can also be tough because a lot of times I think local fish stores were depending upon people just to kind of wander in. They have an idea of what they're looking for, but if they can't find that thing, let's face it, once you've made a commitment to buy a fish, a lot of people will be like, well, that fish wasn't there, but I picked up all these instead, right? Some of us do that. I see that even at the swaps and it's just, it's just what happens, right? So uh, that is definitely a challenge. Does the local fish store know the market that they're in? Do they know the hot fish that are selling? And that can be really hard for them, right? To kind of figure that out. I saw some comment in here, which is flying by, but it said fish, the local fish store often sells fish that sell, not necessarily fish that are unique. And there have been yeah. some fish stores around us that have definitely <laughs> fallen into that. And that's great for a little while until all the people, all your potential customers have gotten all those fish that are popular or let's say easier to keep or more like beginner type fish and they're looking for something different and there's no reason to ever go back to that local fish store again. So that can absolutely be a, a potential issue. Now, my opinion, strong fish stores, fish stores in 2024, what role do they play? they're going to struggle with equipment, right? Just because everybody goes online, if they find it cheaper online, they're doing what I do and they're just kind of lazy, not lazy, but they've just gotten into the habit of buy the thing online, have it shipped. It'll show up at your front door tomorrow. A lot of times it's cheaper than what you can find in a brick and mortar building. So that's absolutely going to be a challenge where they have to thrive. And I think where we would all, all appreciate where if they were thriving in this area was their fish, and the advantages that they could potentially have there. So one thing, I mentioned this already. When you go to a swap and you're buying fish from us, we quarantine for four weeks, right? We make sure the fish are in our fish room four weeks before the swap. A lot of fish stores would never be able to do that. I, I think that is a big ask. I think it's the, the rightest way to do it, the bestest way but not necessarily the most practical way for most businesses when they've got a lot of overhead and they've got a brick and mortar building and they've only got a limited amount of space. But I don't think it's too much to ask for a local fish store to quarantine their fish for two weeks. I think that would alleviate a lot of problems. And again, if we're looking at the role fish stores play, well, wouldn't it be nice if you walk into a pet store and you're like, hey, these fish that are for sale, we've had them for two weeks and things like ick, or, hey, are they eating and all that kind of, a lot of those upfront, like frontline questions, those would be answered. Because in two weeks, the fish aren't eating after two weeks, they probably aren't showing up in their, you know, their sale tanks, at least not looking normal. Uh, it would usually show up within two weeks. Some of the bacterial stuff, some of the internal parasites, maybe, maybe not. But I think that alleviates a lot of problems. And so for those fish stores that are doing that, I think if you ever see that, even if the fish costs a little bit more, that might be a pet store that you reward with your, your voting dollars because in the long run, buying fish that have been quarantined for two weeks, even if it's more expensive up front, if the number of fish that you lose in your quarantine process goes down dramatically, well, hey, maybe that's an overall win. All right, what else? What else do fish stores need to do? You mentioned selection. What did you mean necessarily by that? What do you, selection in terms of what? Well, besides fish, and I think that, well, I'm sure they know how to do it, the percentage of ones like your, your typical common fish that you want to replace part of your school, you know, some of them get older and die off, um, but also some that are going to be m more interesting, that they're going to always constantly rotate tanks. But then also plants, uh, especially these days, it's not getting less frequent. It's getting more frequent. The pe people are wanting to by plants so i think they need to have the plant game well and that's a good point so but not only plants like we mentioned earlier where local fish stores should be winning is with your plants with your fish and with your hardscaping rocks and wood All right you can go there you can, we have a, a pet store by us it is a place where um a zuse 
-hmm. And you can go there and they've actually got like a, a sandbox, like literally a six foot thing. And then they have it measured out. So if you want four feet of space, but you can have up to six feet of space, they measure out the width as well. It's great. And so you can take rocks and wood from their Set massive selection yeah. and just kind of place it wherever and see what it looks like. And how cool is that? They even right. have like scatter rocks, larger pieces, yep. you know, just like gravels that you can add in there and a little scooper that you can take Sift it right out and out. Yep. buy it. it. It's amazing. It, it basically invites people, hey, come hang out, get an idea together, you know, figure out what your hardscape is going to look like. And I think in the long run, when people do that, they're probably a lot more likely to buy. Like once you've got that figured out, now you're taking a picture while you're there of the thing while it's in their little, their sandbox thing that they've got going on. And now you're like, okay, now it's now it's game on. So yeah. absolutely with selection, not only for fish, but for plants, but for hardscaping. That selection thing can be tough, as I mentioned already, because what you need with the selection is you need to have your finger on the pulse of the aquarium keeping uh, customer base in your area because it's going to be different from one area to another. And I would say not only do local fish stores need to know the hot fish that everybody's looking for, they need to... They need to know the hot fish that people are looking for with the water parameters that are found predominantly in their area. So for instance, let's just say wild caught Altum Angels become the thing. Somebody puts an Altum Angel tank together and it's all over the internet and everybody wants them now. You got a pet store that's around here and they start carrying Altum Angels, wild Altum Angels, and they're in RO water. Well, most customers don't necessarily understand that, hey, I need softer water with a low pH. I'm going to have to really be careful with these guys, especially if they're wild caught. That might not make a lot of sense for a pet store around us where everybody's got hard water and your customer base, those who are running RO, it's going to be pretty small. Right? It's going to be a pretty small customer base of your overall number of customers. So finding not only the selection of fish, but fish that are going to thrive. People ask all the time for us, hey, why don't you bring in, uh, I don't know, I used to say Cardinal Tetras, but then we found a source that did really well in our hard water. But once we found that, yeah, we brought them in. But Altum Angels, we could bring those in, I suppose, and they would do horribly. There are some plecos that a lot of the, the really expensive high-end plecos would never do. They, a lot of them don't do well in our hard water with a high pH. Uh, German Blue Rams are another one that kind of fizzle out. A pist with the exception of we've got a pistogram of Panduro that are going through quarantine right now. Great Episto does actually really well in our hard water. But a lot of them, they don't. So people ask, hey, how come you don't have a lot of Apistos? Because I know that if they even make it through our quarantine process, which they probably will for four weeks, I know they fizzle out. I know like the Borrelii, within eight weeks, most of them are probably not going to be with us anymore. So I'm not doing that. And then the pet stores have to think about that as well. Um, fish guarantees, right? Quarantine your fish for a couple of weeks. Make sure your customers understand that, hey, if this, if you're, as long as you're provided that your tank is properly cycled, right? That's not a pet store's problem when, when somebody buys fish and it throws them in a brand new aquarium without anything cycled, that shouldn't be on the pet store. But if your tank is properly cycled and you lose fish, there should be some type of a safety net there saying, hey, okay, let's make that right. We'll do an exchange, store credit, something like that. A lot of the online retailers are doing that, so the local fish stores are going to have to too. This was the comment that I, I saw briefly in there, buying when the local fish store can buy fish from local breeders. That creates community. And I think that's one of the biggest Absolutely. things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if you've got somebody who, especially if they're breeding fish that don't ship all that well, right, that go through the import and wholesale process very poorly, like some, you believe it or not, bristlenose plecos don't ship all that well. They don't go through the, the supply chain very easily. Small angelfish, believe it or not, actually don't do all that well either. So when you've got those local breeders th that aren't overrunning the market with one specific type of angel, but if they can do that, uh, guppies, right? A, a lot of the guppies sometimes don't go through the supply chain all that well. That's why so many of you have problems with why can't I keep guppies alive? Because depending on where they're getting them from overseas, when they go through that supply chain, they wind up at the local fish store and then they kind of get to your aquarium and eventually just kind of fizzle away. Um, so those can all be really good options. You mentioned the scaping stuff, right? For building community. I, what else could they do to build? If you were a local fish store, knowing that you have to compete against all these other places. How else could you build community? 
I personally think it would be fun to have like special nights, special days. Um, why don't, see, this is what I don't understand. Why don't stores have special nights for shopping where they make it more fun, you know, like seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night that they have, you know, the store stays open longer, sales, they have people coming in. I mean, I think LFS should definitely have aquascapers come in. You know, you got Jen Williams, Jeff Miyake's, all these, um, Jonathan Butkus, all of these guys, they just have so much talent and they're willing to share their expertise. Yeah. And I mean, how many people would be drawn into that? Plus member cards punch cards yeah some of encourage, them do just to make it kind of fun yeah. you know yeah. yeah get a junior g-man badge every time you buy a certain yes. number of fish Stickers. or something no and i absolutely agree and i don't know why some by the way some fish stores are doing that yeah and i see it on facebook and i think uh jen williams and jonathan have been part of those before sure. and jeff miyaki as well i think but some of them do some of the some of the ones that are forward thinking and looking ahead will have little um, classes and things like that, or mm -hmm. here's a course in aquascaping, or here's a science course yeah. in the nitrogen cycle, or, you know, here's your free, if I were a pet store, I would offer free pre-cycled filter media. Nice. It'd just be free. Here. Yeah. Got a new tank, put this stuff in your filter as soon as you get home, because I know it's going to save us all a bunch of problems. So you don't need to charge for that. It, it doesn't cost much. I mean, get a filter floss, get some, you know, I saw one, uh, it was, hold on, I actually have a picture here. Let's see. Uh, this place here is Aquatics Unlimited. It's in uh, just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And they have this help desk. And I'm trying to see uh, whenever this picture was taken. I don't think they have it. But somewhere right in the middle when we went there one time, they had a big tower. It, it was these little, it was basically biomedia. And it was pre-cycled biomedia. And it was really cool that they, they actually had that. But yeah, definitely if you've got, the community where you can do courses, you can do little classes, workshops. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, on that night, maybe you get 10% off, right? And I mean, think about how fun that would be for, for just people. I mean, if you like to go to these live streams and stuff, well, what if you could, especially if you don't have a, a fish club in your area, right? Maybe you could go there and the fish store starts taking back some of that community, which they used to be so good at when that was the only game in town. Now, there is something that I think that every fish store should have, at least the big ones. I'm sure a lot of the smallers wouldn't be able to do that, but if I were to open up a fish store, of course it would be called the Smallscape, but it would be called, are you ready? Okay. The Smallscape Cafe, because it would have a cafe attached right to it, because you have to serve coffee if you want community. And fish sticks. Um, no, <laughs> no fish sticks. Oh yeah. Um, Lots of comfy seatings, little cafe tables to encourage you to stick around. Green neon crackers made out of real green neons. Like little, little dojos at neons. each table. Looking. That would be amazing. It would be. It would It would actually be really cool. You know, the other thing too, and some of the some of the pet stores we've been to have done a really good job of this. This was Animal Planets in Deerfield, Illinois. And we're not sp sponsored. They don't even know that we're putting their stuff up here. These were... Um, just ones that we've come across in our area that we're familiar with. Animal Planet, real clean. Tanks are very clean. They have, they, they really focus in on like nano fish. So they know their market, which is nice. And, and I think that's so important for the fish stores in 2024 is be presentable. Yeah. Right? When you walk in, you don't want to see dead fish. You certainly don't want to see sick fish. You don't want to see nasty tanks. Although tanks, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Tanks with algae can be some very healthy tanks with some very healthy fish. The problem is a lot of potential customers are going to look at aquariums that maybe don't have a pristine sort of clean look like these do and be like, you know what? If you can't take care of your aquariums, are you really taking care of your fish? And they're not necessarily correlated 100% because if you look at, and a lot of you who breed fish know, man, there's nothing better than having a big mound of green hair algae or just some just algae growth in general on the sides and the back of the tank. You, you know, for some of you that are breeding, you don't mind that because you know that it's fish food and that it can make fish pretty happy. But that's not what the pet store is doing. It's not what the local fish store is doing. They need to have a presentable, presentable fish tanks. But this is something you always bring up, temperature. Right? Do you, how much do you love when you walk into a pet store and it's like 84 degrees and it's humid? I'll be outside. Yeah. Yeah. You don't spend as much time there because it's uncomfortable. No. And I understand that 
that can be something that is, well, in a sense, somewhat necessary because it's really expensive to heat individual tanks. But there are a lot of stores have figured it out, right? A lot of stores have figured out how to put heating into sump systems and circulate the, that heated water throughout their aquariums. But yeah, it can be a little bit rough as we sit here. I was. And, <laughs> I knew that's uh, you're laughing and I'm like, um, we haven't <laughs> as we wipe away the sweat down here in the fish gallery. I'm, I'm trying to look over there because we have a, a humidity and, and temperature gauge. And I believe we'll see our we in this time of year because the heat's not always on. We also have to run a space heater down here just to kind of keep the temperatures elevated to 82 degrees with a it's humidity a of 82. only 41 percent. So that's not too bad. That That's pretty good. That's about where it normally it's is. Amazing. So but. Again, we don't have customers coming in here. It's just us. So it's a little just bit warm. Us. So be it. Uh, Fisher is here. Fish, Alex oh, what's is up? here. What's up? What's hey, up? Alex. So um, the building community, the classes, all that stuff, I, understanding your customer base, understanding the water parameters, understanding what they want, playing that educational role again with those workshops or just your employees, making sure your employees are well-trained and knowledgeable and can interact with your customers and and give them good information because imagine this. Can we just hold on? Can we just play uh, the imaginary game? This we'll call it the prime time aquatics community's ultimate fish store experience. This is all of us. Okay. All of us putting all of our Come minds on. together. Okay. So you walk in, there's an amazing selection of fish. Hmm. I pretty much, I, I know within reason you fish stores can't have be all things to all people, but great selection of fish, unusual things too. There's, I'm not saying the whole pet store has to be filled with unusual fish, but there needs to be a section where people are like, huh, I've never seen that before. And I've been in the hobby for 20 years or get kind of close to that. Right? So it needs to be a little bit of a wow factor, clean tanks, comfortable to be in. They have scheduled Let's say once a month, they have a, a workshop with somebody free. Uh, they have your little fun card thing where, you know, you get rewarded, right? Punch like a card. rewards card, punch card, whatever. And maybe on that night where the, when they're doing the, uh, the uh, course, whatever it is, it's like 10% off. Fish are healthy because they have an entire room that is dedicated. No, you're not a tire room, but a section, a, a rack of tanks that's dedicated to quarantining their fish for two weeks. Do they serve coffee? Just the coffee machine? Maybe. Yeah. Well, so for the it's workshops, like, yeah, they bring in pizza and stuff like that. Pizza and coffee. It's a great combination. I don't drink coffee, but I would imagine that. No, I shouldn't. <laughs> that would be horrible. But anyway. <laughs> That'd be weird. Then you, you have your own little spaces where you have the workshops, the sandboxes, where you can kind of make your own creations, right? Yes. How cool would that be? People are friendly. They're knowledgeable. That would be pretty awesome, too. And... I think at that point in 2024, the, the local fish stores could still absolutely compete. They can compete with online and they would have some, obviously they would have some equipment there, uh, filters and all that kind of stuff, but it, it wouldn't, I don't think that the local fish store can rely upon sales of equipment and expect to make a bunch of money. They're not, not competing online where their strength is going to be as in community is in education as, and it is in the fish. Wouldn't you agree? Now, Alex brings up a good point. Um, his pets, uh, pet store pet peeve, bad lights. Oh, awesome. They, Absolutely. Yeah, you're 100% right. Yeah. The, the pet stores, and again, I'm showing this picture here. Here's another one. Let me, let me see here. Uh, this is Fish Gallery outside of Dallas. Uh, High-end fish store. Uh, and, and in some ways, fish stores have to be careful because the more display tanks they add, the more wow factor they add, the more the overhead they have to maintain all those tanks, obviously to purchase those tanks. So you got to be a little bit careful there because a lot of us want all of these things. They want a pet store that looks like this. And then they walk in, they're like, holy cow, look at the prices on these fish. You can't have it both ways. You can't have a store that has high overhead and really cool stuff to look at and have a wow factor and then expect dirt cheap fish. But you're absolutely right about the lighting. When pet stores get this right, they sell way more fish because good lighting, it doesn't have to be expensive. It just has to be decent lighting that can illuminate the fish, show off their best colors. And absolutely, that, that can make a big difference for sure. And yes, Ed, if I'm going to be serving coffee, there will be donuts and or cookies. Oh, well, thank goodness for that. Of course. Cody, thank you so much for being a prime timer the last couple months. I live in... Uh, 
hold on. This is my small screen. This is my small screen. I'll be on Illinois, Southern Illinois, and my favorite local fish store, Winfin Aquatics, is an hour away in Evansville, Indiana. Love that place. Yeah, we're willing to travel. We will absolutely travel. Thankfully, we've got a couple. Uh, we have Trop Aquatics and Lombard. I think I have them over here somewhere. This is just one of their aisles. It was a bad picture. <laughs> I got a, a thing off there. Trust me, this is actually, they've done a lot of work with this store over the last they have few nice years. Plants too. Yeah, and they've worked on their selection a lot. So reasonable prices. But yeah, they're, but we're willing to travel to a, if we, you know, Aquatics Unlimited is in Milwaukee. We're in the Chicagoland area. We'll go up there. Yeah, we try to get up there once a year. I don't think we did last year, but uh, the the other one, and I couldn't find a good picture of this. Uh, what was that? Advanced Aquariums in Green Bay. That's a, that is absolutely a place people need to go to because it's all these, the whole store is vintage tanks. I did a fish room Insane. tour of it. Yeah. It was, it, would, it was Advanced Aquariums. Just look for that fish store tour. I promise you, you'll be like, that is an incredibly awesome place. Uh, unusual fish. He focuses on fish. A lot of them I had never seen before. And then the place is just an awesome vibe. Desert Fish has been a prime timer for 40 months. You gotta be one of the originals. You know, like in some of like the motorcycle clubs, they have like the first nine or the first 10. I think Desert Fish might be one of them. I know that now name. they have glow. Now they have glow angel fish. Um, I saw that really? on a Facebook wow. post. Uh, yeah, I saw the the glow angels, and I was like, "There's, there's going to be glow everything. Either you like it or you don't." I, <laughs> I don't tend to get super upset about it because the 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 way that they're glowing, it's a gene insertion, so it's not like they're dying the fish. And if they're not living as long, that's one thing. If there's any evidence, like I, I, I will tell you, the glow bettas. I don't even know if they sell those anymore. But they, ours they went do. blind. I know that yeah. we had a friend. Theirs went blind. So it was like, yeah, that was that was bad. But if they're relatively healthy, and that's what people want. I mean, okay. I mean, there's so many line bred and hybridized fish out there already. And some of the line bred fish are getting so bad with the, the accumulated mutations. I would venture to guess that some of these fish that are glow fish actually have better genetics <laughs> than some of the line bred fish that just keep being bred and bred and bred and bred. And pretty soon they're Sad. just absolutely genetic trash. Hip Hop Hillbilly, thank you so much for being a prime timer the last three months. Any plans to come to the Ohio Cichlid Association events again? Maybe the extravaganza in November. Uh, I love the that particular event has a special place in my heart. I, I really love it. The only problem with it is it's it's right up against Aquashella um, Daytona, and so we just can't do both because I think. Aquashella, from what I can remember the last few years, is Aqu we, we went like three years ago and it was really tough because we were we went to one of the Aquashellas, we were back for a week, and then we were in the at, at the you extravaganza. Were. You were. I Yeah, I no, was you went to the last one. You did. The extravaganza? No. You went to well the last one we were at, I think you went to. The one before that it was me and Kasha. And possibly the one before that as well. But you I went to I'm the last one. Up. We had a little table, but yeah, so I don't know. It's just I would love to go. It's just the clash of the timing and all that stuff. Uh, Cody, thank you so much for the super chat. Appreciate it. Wednesday nights and with prime time. Love you guys and love everyone in the chat. Y'all are pretty much my only community and a great one at that. Well, thank you for being here because again, we look forward to this as hopefully as much as you do uh, because it's, this is, it's, it's one of those things we talk about. It would be cool to have, a local fish store that built that community live and in person. But for some people, let's face it, it's really tough to get out of the house and or you had a long day at work and you're like, you know what? I would rather just put on a, on a you know, put this live stream on and be able to hang out with everybody in the chat and talk fish. And sometimes that's a, a pretty awesome thing. You know? Yeah, it is. But yeah. What, what, Oink, Oink wants to know if we can convert you and Ed to coffee drinkers. Never. You know, Maybe Ed, I don't know, but... He, um, he does drink hot cocoa, and that's the closest and thing. Tea. And you will drink tea. Oh, absolutely. I like tea. Yeah. So I just don't like water that tastes like dirt. That's all. Teach their own. Uh, I can actually, I can deal with like the smell of coffee okay. It's really? not my favorite smell in the world, but it's the, it's the whole drinking of it part that no way. Because as good as it smells, it yeah. never tastes quite that good, but it's good and good for you. And, uh, oh, and... And uh, Whip says that if Harley can have special nights with discounted products, pet stores can too. I know. I 
Agreed. Yep. We, we do every month. We do the hog. It's the Harley owners group meetings at our local uh, Harley dealer. It's a lot of fun. We just, we go there, we hang out. They talk about the rides <laughs> that are going to be planned and it's maybe an hour. And then we, we kind of just disperse, you know, maybe go get some food with some people there. But yeah, <laughs> I think pet stores, they're missing such an opportunity there. And again, the big thing is do it after hours, make it a thing, advertise it. Hey, uh, when, not Wednesday, cause that would conflict with us. So pet stores don't do it on a Wednesday, but Tuesday, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, don't. Somebody's like, wait, wait a minute, I stream on a Tuesday, but whatever, some night here, we're going to do this thing. It's the second Tuesday night of every month. And here's the schedule and, and promote it, put it out there on Facebook and Instagram and, and, you know, do your email blast and Hey, there's going to be food and all this stuff and 10% off. People will eventually show if it's consistently scheduled at the same, same time where people can expect it. Ed says, I hate coffee. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, That's I don't right. know what you're going to drink with your cookies and donuts. Well, see, you're Rick, on your Rick own. says the same thing. Coffee tastes terrible. I agree, but I still drink it. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> it tastes terrible, but I drink it anyway. I thought you wow. were. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. My goodness. All right. Let's see here. Now, I mean, if you've got questions, feel free to bring them on in because we'll be answering away. Hold on. <laughs> Shamu, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. I can't imagine, I can't, I can't quarantine because of a strict, I one tank only rule can't even use a plastic bin. So I gotta be super picky uh, about where I buy my fish from. No disease outbreak since 2016. Knock on wood. That's good. That's good. Yeah. The plastic bin is actually a really good idea because that's something in theory, you could set it up, throw some filter, uh, throw a sponge filter and that's been cycling in your, your regular tank or even just the sponge itself is stuck in the back of a hang on back filter perfectly. And a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to run sponge filters in my aquarium because I don't like the way they look. Totally understand that. That's why we don't have sponge filters in here, but all of them are over there. Take the sponge out, you know, especially if it's like a hydro too, the, the skinnier tall ones. Most of the time, those can fit in the back of a hang on back filter compartment. Just throw it in there. It will still collect all the beneficial bacteria. And then for your quarantine tank, slap the plastic pieces on, run a little airline in there. If you're going to use a plastic bin, it would have to be clear because you have to be able to see if the fish are sick. But absolutely, it, it, that could definitely be a thing. Chris says, I just got five new turquoise rainbow fish. Oh, nice. Very cool. <gasps> I love the turquoise yep. rainbow fish. Yeah, we've got so a bunch pretty. of yeah. rainbows in this tank right there, right behind Joanna's head. Uh, there's a variety of uh, Macalochi red rainbows. There's a couple turquoise in there, uh, Kurumoi, and even some dwarf rainbows. Blake, pretty. appreciate the super chat. Thank you. Uh, with a 55 gallon tank with 12 black neons, one bristle nose, one odo, two congos, five quarries left in my tank after battling ick. Sorry that happened. Was searching for ideas for restock and a centerpiece fish. I like a pistos and turquoise rainbows. Those are both great options. Um, yeah, they would both work. You could do both. I mean, you've got space in there, so you could easily, in a 55 gallon, you could do a couple different uh, pistos, uh, pistol pairs if you wanted to. There's plenty of space for them to kind of spread out, assuming you've got some rock work or some wood and some plants in there. Um, so pick a couple of your favorite pistols and get a pair each. And then uh, the turquoise rainbows, absolutely. In a, in a four foot tank, you, you could definitely put in six or eight. Uh, they don't get super huge. You might want to add to your Odos, right? Just because you got one, they'd feel more comfortable. There were five, six, seven, eight of them in there. Uh, or you could add to your Congos. I know you just said you went through Ick, so I'm assuming you probably had more of these fish. And unfortunately with the Ick outbreak, you, it's just the way it happens. You lose some, but yeah, you could, both of those are options. You know, it's, it, it's so stressful going through fish disease and we deal with it here. You know, we deal with it with quarantining fish. We, uh, I'll give you an example. We had um, a bunch of the uh, Rhino Lacara, the L11A whip tail. I call them plecos. A lot of people call them catfish. They're the red ones. And I had 80 and I now have three. So it, they came in a little bit smaller. Don't know what happened because the other, I actually had to put them in a quarantine tank that we're in with fish that were already in quarantine, but now those fish have to get reset. Uh, thankfully, we don't have a swap for a while uh, where we need that tank. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, it's not the perfect world. You know, that's why we quarantine for four weeks because the fish that you see at the swaps, they made it through disease free. That tank is fine. But that 
L11A, we lost, like I said, a whole mess load of them. So it's never, it's always stressful. I don't care if you're dealing with one tank or you've been through it a million times and you've got a million different fish and like, oh, anytime you got a tank that, that gets hit hard, it stinks, especially when you try everything you know and it's like, this isn't working because that happens. Michelle says that uh, um, I love our beginner plant pack. You had a discount code for last week. The plants are awesome. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Yay, is that yeah, fun? Yeah, products has some really oh nice my plants. Gosh. My um, dwarf water lily is looking fire. Fish Story said, uh, Laetacara Victorian mouth brooders would be very cool in that 55 gallon. Absolutely. Uh, we have some of the dwarf mouth brooders and a 40 breeder. I just saw they, they got really popular on Facebook all of a sudden. I'm like, I think it's because somebody in the GCCA had them, Greater Chicago Cichlid Association. I'm like, <laughs> I've had like a half a dozen in this 40 breeder. In fact, I had 60 or 70 of them I brought to swaps. I think they were thinking like, oh man, they're, they're you know, no one's had them for a while. I'm like, no, they're, they're floating around the Chicagoland area because I sold about 70 of them in the last six months. So they're around, but they're really, really, really pretty fish. They're very small. They stay small. The uh, dwarf mouth birders do. All right, let's see here. Jennifer says, is there a good place to buy shrimp from? They would be shipped to Georgia. We are, full disclosure, we are sponsored by Flip Aquatics, flipaquatics.com. They are probably the largest, I, I, not probably, they are the largest shrimp retailer, online retailer in the United States, I believe. And they got that right away for a reason because they know what they're doing when it comes to shipping and selling shrimp. I would check them out, flipaquatics.com. All right, hold on a second here. I saw something and it went right on by. Michelle says, do you have a reputable place to get electric blue acaras? So your video, saw your video on them and I want, they're cool. They're awesome fish, very hardy fish. So electric blue acaras. I don't know if someone in the chat has a place where, you know, you're like, oh, I've gotten electric blue acaras from this place and they were awesome. Whenever someone is asking me about a fish that is maybe not as common online, I always, you know, the places that I that will most likely have them are places like the Wet Spot. Uh, they're on the on the uh, West Coast, but they've got an, a massive, massive inventory. So when you're looking for fish like that, they can certainly be an option. Check out your local fish stores too. Yeah, uh, one million fish because they're they're relatively common. Uh, relatively easy to breed in like at the swaps there's almost always people who have them at the swaps around us yeah sharpie says the green neons we bought from you at gcc are doing great that's awesome to hear yeah when it comes to the neons we have with the sources that we have we've had incredibly good luck like i said cardinal tetras for the longest time if you would have asked me i said hey sorry we've got hard water with a high ph cardinal tetras don't do well and i was actually talking to somebody at um, where was that place I went to? Keystone Clash. And there was a vendor there that had extremely awesome Cardinal Tetras. And I started asking him questions. Hey, what, what kind of water parameters? Like, oh, and he shared his water parameters and they were very similar to mine. I'm like, are you importing these? He's like, yeah. And so he gave me the lowdown. And sure enough, I brought in 500 Cardinals and they were just killing it. They were so beautiful. And I think out of the 500 we brought in, I think we lost like maybe one or two. Uh, these other ones that, and I'm pointing back here because we have a bunch in this tank behind my head, the Diamond Head Neon Tetra. It's another one where I actually made a mistake. I was, I thought I was ordering Diamond Tetras, you know, the shiny silvery ones, and I didn't read it close enough. And all of a sudden, the, the, you know, the shipment these? comes in. I'm looking at this bag, and I'm like, the heck? this, th these are not Diamond Tetras. And then I throw them in the tank, and I'm looking at them because when fish get shipped, they, they all come in really pale and you know, because they, they've been in the dark, right? They've been in a box, so they, they lose all their color. And you put them in the tank, and you don't really necessarily want to put them in a tank and leave the lights on. You kind of want to turn the lights off, let them acclimate. And so I'm looking at them like, all right, I'm going to turn the lights off. I'll come back down here. They're all isolated in a couple different tanks. And sure enough, I came back down. I'm like, this is a neon. So I look at the list. I'm like, diamond head neon. I'm like, oh, that one's on me. But they're awesome fish. And it, there was another one where when we did the green neons, We've really been lucking out lately where we'll yes. get 500 in a time and maybe we'll lose a couple, two or three. You're so, so beautiful. Yep. So Sharpie, tell them that I said hi. Who are you saying hi to? Sharpie's um, green neons. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry, I, I missed that part. I missed the, uh... <laughs> oh, this is a good one. 
uh, Adrian says, do you know anything about the banded Leporanus? Think thinking about getting one for my tank. I had at one point, I didn't have the banded. They get big, by the way, so they're going to be big and they can be a little bit rambunctious. So I, I don't necessarily consider them a community fish, but they get really big. But I had the spotted Leporanus. I had a, a group of them. I saw them at a pet store and it's actually it was actually a pet store I don't normally buy fish from. But at the time, like, I need these fish. They were so pretty. If you haven't looked them up, look up the spotted Leporanus. And they were actually in one of the fish room tours that I did probably in 2020 or 2021, somewhere around there. And they were insanely beautiful. And then they're also jumpers. So be careful with that. At least mine were. I wound up losing. I had three of them. One died, one got stuck on a filter, and one jumped. So uh, that's basically how that worked out. But big fish. So you got to have a lot of space for those bad boys. And uh, you see them often. A lot of people are stocking them with South and Central American cichlids. Not like the true, not, not like flower horns or something like that. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a big fish. Emma actually works at a local fish store at TK Aquatics. If you're ever in the Oklahoma area, oh, cool. you should hit us up. Nice. Oklahoma. Yep, we drive through there on our way to Dallas sometimes. Yeah, we do. Gardaki says, in Chicago, I wish we had more European, Japanese-style aquarium shops, more geared towards adult-style aquariums. I yeah. would say, and I don't know where you've been you know, in the Chicagoland area pet stores, probably the ones that you would like the most would be Zuze. Yep. And maybe, well, Fish Planet, I don't necessarily know if that's... No. I think they have a lot of fish that could be kept in the types of a tank. Yeah, but they're not aquascaping focused. No, no, they're not. No. Zuze and South Elgin would Yummy. probably be the one that I think you would enjoy the most. Oh, and there, Andrew says, there you go. And that's Zuze and South Elgin. <laughs> yep, that's that's the one. Uh, and yeah, that, a very cool place. And here's a, here's a good question from Christine. Um, if you have a heavily planted tank, how do you vacuum the substrate without pulling up plants? Or do you just do water changes? That's a good question. That is a great question. I can tell you what we do, and that is we gravel vac. So I'm not, but we have to be careful because the plants that are in the substrate are crypt, usually crypts and sometimes sword plants and then jungle veil. And we generally, st we don't necessarily gravel vac right next to the, like the, base of a plant will kind of go around it but we've never had an issue where we've uprooted plants by gravel vacuum because crypts and swords especially will send a root system out if you were to look under your aquarium at a single crypt the root system will be considerably more it will be considerably larger and more complex than the part of the plant that you actually see so you're you're not uprooting a, an established plant usually uh, so for gravel yeah we just gravel vac because you pretty much have to otherwise you're going to start you your plants can't break down all those nutrients. So uh, and same with sand. We'll kind of gently go in there around it and just get the stuff off the surface, being careful not to suck the sand up into the gravel vac. But, and you've done videos, actually, I think, on your channel, right, on maintaining planted tanks. Didn't you do one? Did I? Or did I do one? I thought you did. With a small gravel vac. Well, I had a and that's the other thing, too, is use a small, you know, you can use a smaller gravel vac that will take up less create less suction so you can worry about you don't have to worry about it quite as much mm -hmm. yeah i would just be real careful right around the mm -hmm. the plants they especially if you've got root tabs in there as well so if you just put root tabs in you don't really want to expose and especially for us because when we first plant the tank we do a lot of the diy root tabs which uh, with the gel caps and those gel caps disintegrate and then you just have the fertilizer in the in the actual substrate and so if we suck those up then you got those floating little pellets everywhere which is not ideal this is a fun question are you ready? I don't know if I'm ready for a fun question. Oh, yeah. It's from Carl. Okay. So for my Eagle, uh, Eagle Scout project, I'm going to do a 55-gallon planted tank. Going to show kids how to take care of freshwater tanks. What types of fish do you recommend for a classroom? That's a great question. That's a fun fish question. Fish that are going to be colorful and that they're going to be active and they're going to be outgoing. There's a few fish that come to mind right away. Clown plecos. No, not. <laughs> that's the opposite of everything I said. It, it's here. This is why this can be so interesting. Common fish, it's the guppy. Now, here's why the guppy is going to attract a lot of attention because it checks all those boxes. It's active. It's too stupid to know that there's any kind of danger in the area, so it is just going to be oblivious to everything coming near a tank. 
the males get a mixed group get for every male that you have get three or four females just so that the females have a lot of space and the males have a lot of options but you're going to get a lot of breeding how cool would that be if it's in a classroom and and kids can see little tiny fry think about it we as adults get super excited by that imagine what the kids will be like when they see oh here's the fish oh my gosh look at all the babies so that can be cool endlers again fish that are going to and plus you can have a lot of them in a 55 gallon right uh quarry cats for the bottom they're not going to eat your fry um green neons green neons will well i don't know if they would eat the fry but they probably they, they could no, but put they're it beautiful dense. yeah but i don't not for kids they're, they're too shy and they don't move around enough they're not colorful enough in my opinion you could do platies you could do mollies you could do sword tails <laughs> in a tank like that as well um, probably a couple types of bristlenose plecos or something just to kind of make sure that all the stuff is getting eaten uh mystery snails just because again you're drawing interest to that tank because you've got the guppies they're crazy they're, they're swimming around they're making babies the snails are just something different to see like oh wow look at that there's snails in there too and quarry cats because they're all they're all goofy silly as well yes absolutely yeah. have to have quarries wet sleeves thank you so much for the super chat really appreciate it i went from individual air pump for each tank to a central air system that's cool now i have 35 plus dead fish not cool from multiple tanks since i installed it on sunday can the new pump be the cause of it it's wow um Yikes. yeah I, w I would have a lot of questions there so yeah i mean that's that's if that's the only thing that changed right i mean let's assume that you didn't add any new fish to your aquariums and that the only thing you did was hook up the lines to the i'm assuming you use some type of pvc or some hose 35 that's a lot of fish multiple tanks installed it on sunday we're at wednesday right now i did you use so the questions i would have is did you use any kind of sealant for the uh, if you use i'm looking over there because we've got the pvc so for the pvc was there was there some type of chemical in there that that could have gotten it kind of gassed off into the tank? That would be my question. Provided again that you didn't add in any new fish anywhere in the system and maybe transfer disease from one tank to another. Uh, but that's the only thing I could think of is if there was either if you use PVC or some type of hose that it was it, was it lined with like a, a anti mold thing on the inside. Or was it like a silicone that might have been used that gassed off? Was, was it painted? Was the was there a uh, the PVC? Was it a painted kind or was it white or was it? That would be all of my questions. But it is possible. I mean, if nothing else has changed, keep an eye on everything. And if, if everything is okay now, maybe you've whatever was in that system gassed off, and unfortunately, you you lost some fish. But hopefully, that's the extent of the the issue. All oh, this fishery, yeah, I agree with you. I wish hobby, I wish the hobby had cheap O2 testing units. I do too. I, I've looked at it. I'm sure you have too, because you're you're a science freak like I am, and I've looked at seriously considered getting an O2, uh, an O2 meter for our fish room. It just didn't make any sense. So for a for one that you can actually rely upon, it's it's easily what six, seven, eight hundred bucks, and it's just not worth it unless you're in an industrial you have an industrial system or a wholesaler or you've got you know, you're, you're doing fish breeding in ponds or something like that. Mac, thank you so much for gifting the five primetime aquatics memberships. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And now let's see. Oh, look at that. Fisheries in. <laughs> David, local guy, Kayla, nice. and Jazzy Bell Pink are all now. And oh, my goodness. Now, here we go. Fish family, thank you so much uh, for, oh, he said thank you for gifting the five time uh, five primetime aquatics memberships. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. That's pretty awesome. I really appreciate it. Very cool. Ah, good point, Slam Boy. Uh, what was, what is on your hands when you put them into the tank? Yeah. Cause you, again, yeah. If you had any kind of silicone or any kind of uh, coating on your you hands, just did some cleaning beforehand. Yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Rebecca says, Oh, how I love access to a lab. Yeah. And th I have that advantage to, to a certain extent. Not, I, you know, that's actually a good question. I wonder if we have an O2 uh, meter at school. I don't know why we would. I should probably ask around because there's some stuff I've been wanting to do with one of those for a while. 
But the nice thing is we've got face contrast microscopes. We have, you know, high-end bright field light microscopes. I have all the ability to test, well, I shouldn't say all, but most media that where I would need to test for uh, microbes. So, cause I mean, even our students work on unknowns every semester in our microbiology class. Uh, so yeah, it is, it is kind of nice having that. Garage Gill says PVC glue can certainly gas off. Yeah. PVC glue for sure. When we did ours, I used the fish tank safe silicone, but I also, when I set up our system, I don't think I had any fish in the tanks for quite some time. Like I set it up and I'm pretty sure for at least a week or two, almost all the tanks were sitting empty. It's just how it worked out. So I, I didn't make that conversion in the middle of, you know, having fish. So it was set up and then I did that. All right, what else we got going on here? Shamu says, I wash my hands before sticking them into the tank, but I make sure to spend a good minute thoroughly rinsing with water to make sure the soap is off. Yeah, I, I should probably be better at that. I don't wash my hands as much, but I, I would certainly if I knew that I was, you know, hey, I just went out and worked on my motorcycle. My hands are all oily and filled with WD-40. Then, of course, I wash my hands pretty thoroughly, but... I guess the other thing too is I'm not in these tanks as much as the boys are because Luke maintains all this and Eli maintains the fish room on the other side. And I will periodically go in and, you know, maybe, I don't know, pull a little bit of duckweed out somewhere or, hey, there's a dead fish in a tank. Let me grab that. I do feed the fish in the morning. I'm down here. And plus now that this is all down here, I'm, I'm down here half the day, which is actually really cool because one of the things that I don't think people talk about enough is when you have a fish room, that is in a basement or certainly a fish room that's not directly connected to your house as much as you want to spend time there it it just time gets away from me every day and even with the with the fish room in our basement i didn't spend as much time down here as i would have liked to and once this studio came down here and now we have the gallery in the back well this is also my setup, my computer and everything where I do stuff for my regular job for school and I grade papers and I do all these things. And so now I'm down here much to everybody's liking because now you don't have to see me half a day because it, it's funny. We went from having desks that were what, maybe five feet apart. <sighs> yeah. And then it would always, especially during, you know, the, the times a few years ago, like All right, you got to be quiet. I'm on a zoom. No, I'm going to be on a zoom. Okay. Well, so we're trying to schedule zooms. And then from there I moved into your live stream studio, right? I get out of here. Um, I moved into your live stream studio. So we were a little bit further apart, but still we had to be careful of like, okay, if I had a zoom and then you had a zoom, it's now I'm down here. I don't do it. I, I can like be a teenage loser. Not a he loser. He pretty much I can is. act like a teenager down here if I want. I can play you, my techno music. You and have I've got your my headphones little... on and you don't hear when I'm Well, talking. that too, but he's it's probably good teenager. that I have my headphones on because when I don't have my headphones on, I got my little subwoofer down here and I got my speaker set up. And I can just jam to my techno the entire time I'm grading or doing whatever, editing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's good times. So yeah. What? <laughs> Give me that look. <laughs> you know it's awesome. That's what I'm here for. Ashley says, how does the media that comes with any filter, especially ceramic media, compare to say Seachem Matrix? Great question. I don't know if I can really answer that from a yeah. a user perspective because yeah. I actually don't use any of that kind of media. No. So oh, I shouldn't say that because it's not actually true necessarily anymore with some of these canister filters because they have so much space. I did leave one tray in there with whatever media came with the filter, but I could pull that out in a heartbeat and not be at all concerned because you could pull... I've made this argument before, and this is the way it is in all of our hang on back filters in the, on the other side. The only thing that's in there is some fine sponge, like one little piece and some filter floss, and that's it. And I change the filter floss out, or the boys do, or completely rinse it off in the sink along with that sponge every single week and put it back in. But just in the filter compartment alone, there's a ton of surface area in there. Unless your tanks are insanely heavily stocked, the filter compartment itself holds plenty of bacteria plus the surface area in your aquarium. So I don't add any of that stuff because I don't find it useful. I, I would rather have stuff media in a hang back filter or in these canister filters for all of these tanks that is just trapping stuff. So fine pour sponges and filter floss is pretty much all I run. So when it comes to the ceramic media, Seachem Matrix, every 
filter media manufacturer is going to make an argument, we have more surface area. And I have found it to be 100% pointless because you don't need that much surface area. The microbes only grow to the load of your tank. And even if you saw, and, and prime timers see this at least once a month where I take you around, I show you the fish that we're bringing in and they see how heavily stocked some of these tanks are. It's like, hey, you've got 500 ember tetras and a 40 breeder with a couple sponge filters running. Yep, any ammonia spike? Never, not once. Hey, you've got 500 diamond head neons and a 20 gallon, not 500, but maybe I'd probably break them up in a couple tanks. Never an issue. One little sponge filter because when it comes to biological filtration, we have so much surface area there that I've never found it necessary in like a hang on back or canister to require that stuff. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Um, Farallon, hi Farallon. Hey. Um, wants to know, do the fish dance to the beat? They sometimes do. It depends on the fish. Some fish, you know, they're not into dancing in public. And I get that. So they kind of just chill out and they watch everybody else dance. And that's, that's just what they do. So... You know, and then others, yeah, they like to, hmm. they like to whoop it up. Hmm. It just depends on the fish. Guppies, I find that they're the best, the best dancers. Uh, they like to dance oh, a lot. Oh no! What fish trees asking the prodigy chemical brothers level or like drum and uh, bass in the, in the 90s jungle in the 90s, raver yeah. rager. <laughs> no, so in the 90s, yeah, chemical brothers prodigy loved them back in the 90s. I can remember uh, listening to them all the time. But no, now it's it's pretty much like old school techno, like Emily Lenz, Charlotte Devitt. Uh, DeWitt, uh, Matten, uh, who else? And Fisa. Yeah, it's just it's very one of my, I probably look like an idiot if I went, but like one of my things is I'd love to go to like Tomorrowland if it ever came into like this general area. I would just be there all weekend. I'd probably be the only one there that's not partaking in all the other things that people do when they go to those places. And I would just sit there, sit back and just enjoy the music. Because I can, and you know, I mean, I, like when I go to the gym, that's all I listen to. In the car, that's pretty much all I listen to. But I listen to everything. I mean, I, I'll listen to country, old punk rock from the 80s and early 90s, uh, techno mostly, um, everything. We are pretty much the opposites. Yeah. The only thing yeah, that, we, like, converge would be country. That's it. But other yeah. than that, like, I was, <laughs> I was born at the wrong time. I was somewhere today and there was basically like elevator music playing, but I was just like, oh, it's just so beautiful. And I was like, just wait a second. And then the theme to charade came on, the in instrumental charade. Anybody know? Hmm? Anybody? No. Nobody you knows. would never know. <laughs> Max says, I use Matrix in my 307 and don't see any difference to normal media. I'm sure it does something, but comes across gimmicky to me. Uh, yeah, and some of the chemical media, if you've got problems with odors or you're trying to get chemicals out of your tank, like some of the meds and stuff, if you want to use activated carbon, I totally get that. But I, I just never found it to be a necessary thing. What brand are the lights uh, for the low boy? All of these, all right, so everything here are Aqua Illumination AI. The low boy, these two are here, the AI primes, ridiculously awesome. Like I said, this tank that you see behind us, I want to say you have seven different color adjustments on that. And the highest one right now is at 30%. Most of them are in the low twenties or even the high teens. Uh, and that's the, these lights are, if you can't grow plants with these lights, you can't grow plants because they are, ex they can be extremely bright. All of the lights on the 125s and the 75s are the AI Aqua Illumination blade lights. Uh, they're pricey. You're going to get sticker shock when you see the AI blades. The AI primes are great because they are actually, I've had the Kessels. I've got the Kessels on the other side. I think these are every bit as good as the Kessel lights, and they're not nearly as expensive as the Kessels. So the, the primes I was talking about, but the blades are a top, top, top end LED light. And they're going to be expensive. But again, you've got all that adjustability. I did a review on the blades, but the AI Prime, I'm going to be doing a review on those two because they have an, a ridiculous amount of adjustability. But all these tanks back here, again, right now, I think the brightest we have the lights on it, because I think on the blades, there's five different color settings, might be 40%. Everything else is in the teens or, or low 20s. So gives you an idea. That's how bright they are. They can go really bright so if i had a much taller tank if i had something that really needed to highlight i'm running co2 these are the ones <laughs> that i would i would go to um adrian says was thinking about an ornate bicher and black ghost knife 
fish. Any info about those? I uh, read something about an electric pulse. Yeah, uh, the, the big thing with the ghost knife is their, their size. Well, the Beischer too. I think if I had a Beischer, I'd want minimally a six foot tank, ghost knife, uh, 10 foot tank, maybe 12 foot. Uh, they can get fairly large and it's just not only long, but they get tall. So that's the other thing too. Daniel says, I'm new here. I just came into the chat. Do you have a fish store? Well, Daniel, we're glad that you're here hanging out with all of us fish nerds. Hmm. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, do I have a fish store? Do we have one? No. What we do is we have the gallery here. We have the fish room on the other side. We import a lot of fish. We quarantine them for four weeks, and then we sell them at local fish swaps. So in the Chicagoland area, so Greater Chicago Cichlid Association, Greenwater Aquarius Society, and quad city swap so that's what we do uh, but no we don't have a store we don't sell online people ask that all the time hey how come we don't ship fish if you want fish shipped go to the experts that's flip aquatics that's why we are associated with them uh, we are not experts in shipping fish and i can pretty much guarantee you if i shipped you fish you would have problems and <laughs> i don't want to deal with that so i would rather just know when i go to a swap here are your currently living healthy fish that have been with me for a month i'm handing them off to you and if there is an issue, we know that at least in the transaction, I gave you fish that had survived for at least a month and they were fine. <laughs> so not that problems can't happen, but. <laughs> Slam boy asks Vegas sw fish swaps. <laughs> I have no idea. You would think that, I mean, Vegas has got a pretty decent aquarium community out there. Do they? But I don't know. I have no idea uh, of that there's fish swaps out there, but I, there should be. Flying Gyro, what would you suggest for a single centerpiece fish for a shrimp tank? Don't feel like rolling the dice on a betta. Oh, yeah, that's the, that's the issue, right? The shrimp. Centerpiece, man. I, all right, so here's, here's the thing. To me, a centerpiece fish is usually a single fish or maybe a small selection of very, very colorful, very personable fish. The betta is a great example. Uh, a lot of your small cichlids would be great examples. I trust absolutely no cichlids around shrimp ever. Uh, even the peacock gudgeons, I would say, we have them in this tank. I've done a species profile on them before. but And their mouths are pretty small, but I absolutely know 100% that they will eat shrimp babies. Would they try to consume large shrimp? I've never even tried it before. I just assumed just because they, they are so predatory uh, Kat says maybe a honey grammy. I know the honey grammys would pick off the baby shrimp too. I, I don't know if there is a good centerpiece. I would say other fish. Mystery snail. <laughs> How about a centerpiece invertebrate? Because, I mean, you got shrimp, so centerpiece invertebrate. Go with a mystery snail. That's right. Yeah, that could be a thing. Um, yeah, usually with the shrimp, I'm doing something like the phoenix rasbora or the dwarf rasbora or the chili rasbora something really small and uh, keep a group of them and at least you're getting something swimming around that's not going to put a big dent into your into your fish lefty that's a good one a uh, little thinking outside of the box there a clown pleco oh yeah yep you could that's certainly nice. do that i mean it's not necessarily a fish that's going to be swimming around and maybe not even be out all that much but very beautiful fish sparkling grammy that's another one where i don't think the shrimplets would be safe adults yeah. maybe but i don't know i've always found my grammys like the honeys even the sparkling grammys to be so curious and so like what? <laughs> kayla kayla says sparkling grammys have done damage apparently <laughs> yes <laughs> they do I, have a yeah, dark I just, side I well no I, I just they can be a little they're just curious right and i, yeah, I can see them because they're always foraging grammys are almost always foraging they for food arms. yep and so I could see them be like, oh, what are these little invertebrates without the hard, hey, crusty shell buddy, yet? come over yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, what about Gertrude rainbows? Like a little pair. Would that be adorable? Actually, that is an interesting idea. So the Gertrude rainbows, the Pasky rainbows, these are really, really, really small. So maybe you're going to max They're out magical, an inch and a quarter. Though. Would they potentially, again, eat the shrimplets? I don't know... Well, first of all, they're really tiny, so I don't know how much of a dent they could put in. Like if a female just like, hey, psh, here's 30, and you got like five females kicking out dozens of shrimp every couple of weeks, I don't think they'd be able to put a big enough 
dent into the shrimp population, especially if you've got like Java moths and stuff in there. Uh, that, that, that would be interesting. Yeah. All right, hold on. Cat says, I always see sparkling grammy hunting for food more than my honeys do. Yeah, I wouldn't trust them. Yeah, it's just, yeah, the, the grammys in general, they're, that, that's why a lot, of white, a lot of reasons why people get them is because they always, they're doing stuff, right? And they're very graceful about what they do, which is kind of cool. Gardaki's Playground asks, would you be interested in doing an aquarium chat at the Shed Aquarium? Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Shed? No. No. That would be cool. That would be that would be pretty crazy. Oh yeah, I haven't been there in a long time. I, I would go there. I would do that just to be able to go back there again. That would be pretty awesome. Twenty-five yeah. year old giant grammy at the shed. Yeah, those fish can live a very long time. Uh, definitely not shrimp safe. The giant grammy. <laughs> you know, I just want to throw that in there. Cody, thank you so much for the super chat. Best rainbows for a fifty-five gallon community tank dwarf rainbows, or can I go bigger? You can go bigger. You could, you could do uh, like the turquoise. The reds get a little bit, well, even the reds. I mean, I suppose you could do the reds as well. They're probably one of the larger ones. The kurumoi, the makalochai, uh, bosmanis, and you could mix and match if you wanted to. That's kind of what we've done in this tank over here. Obviously, the males are going to have the better color than the females will, but, yeah, dwarf, but dwarf rainbows don't underestimate how pretty those fish are. We do have a couple of them in that tank as well. Yeah. And unlike the other rainbows, they have that iridescence with those red fins. They would be striking. I think if you're looking for a group that is really going to give you that that striking appearance, you probably best off with the dwarf ne uh, dwarf neon rainbows because you're going to be able to put 15 of them in a in a 55 gallon and be like, yeah, this is this is pretty awesome looking. Um, Rocky Miles, I I was actually thinking of that. What about lamp by rasboras oh uh, for the shrimp yeah 100 percent. yeah right we've we've done that combination with minimal problems yeah lamp by rasboras is really cool rob thank you very much for the super chat appreciate it can you recommend a way to sanitize aquarium gravel i'm breaking down a tank and want to reuse the gravel and don't want to transfer my nasties that may be hiding in our substrate or should i even bother if you've got no disease issues i wouldn't bother i would rinse it out i mean if you're going to store it for a while just so it doesn't smell uh just take a strainer take uh that really nice pasta cooking, you know, strainer that you have in the kitchen and dump your nasty gravel in there and run the water through, shake out all the, the detritus and stuff. Listen, one of the best things that you can do for sterilization of anything in the aquarium hobby is let it dry. A lot of the potential parasites that would infect fish, they need to stay, they, they need an aquatic environment. So things like ick and all that kind of stuff, just let it dry and that takes care of that. Uh, some of the spore formers, maybe not, but if you haven't had any issues, I wouldn't really be overly concerned about it. But rinse it, put it off somewhere, let it dry. Leave, leave the if you've got a you know like let's say you leave it in a bucket. Our mistake sometimes is sometimes we'll accidentally cover the bucket, and it's like, whoo, don't do that because that will let out a horrific smell of decaying organic matter. But leave it uh, open, and then let it dry out and use it again when you want. Cat has a great, great pick. Okay. And this would be for one. Perfect. How about a colorful killifish? What about like a clown killie? Clown killies are very small. They're very small and they always But some of those killifish are are somewhat predatory. Not a killifish expert by any stretch of the imagination. Right. The clown killie, maybe, but I haven't kept them enough and I certainly have never kept them with shrimp. So I don't know what that potential situation could look like like oh they, yeah they that was shrimp uh, stay at the bottom and the the well clown killies clown, mostly yeah mostly at stay at the top but Even i wouldn't say the plants they and stuff exclusively stay there they can be i remember when we had them back here when we brought in a whole bunch uh they in large enough groups they would start to venture all around the tank mm. cody thank you again for the super chat appreciate it I do currently have a 90 gallon community tank with 10 dwarf neon rainbows and two male reds and they are all gorgeous. Okay, so yeah, then you probably do want to switch it up then, right? I mean, if you've got, if you've already got the the 10 of them in a 90, you want to do something different. So yeah, maybe do like the, the turquoise, the Bosmani and the 55 or take the 10 or, or take the 10 dwarf, I mean, I know I'm saying this and it's not necessarily easy to catch those fish because they're freaking crazy, but <laughs> 
although they are also very food driven. And so sometimes that makes it easier. So if you can get those 10 out and throw them in the 55, then you open up the 90 for some of those larger rainbow fish. That could be cool too. Um, Asher's Art asks, would 10 ember tetras and a honey grammy be good stocking for a planted 10 gallon? 10 ember tetras and a, oh yeah, that's good. Do It'd the be yellow. amazing. If you can find the yellow honey grammy especially, uh, yeah. that, that's a, that is a striking, Sweet. striking combination. So um, try that one. Guy, thank you very much for the little sticker. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's awesome. I haven't seen those in a long time. I like the stickers. Yeah. I love uh, stickers. Yeah, ember tetras and a honey grammy. That you do the orange embers Classic with the combo. yeah with. So I, I mention this all the time, but the one of the coolest combos we had was by a mistake, and it <laughs> was embers in a quarantine twenty that I had with some yellow honey grammys that were already in that tank. And what was the third one? The green kubatai. Uh, I think so. I think it was the green kubatai, and it was just an insanely. Awesome, and I didn't get it on camera. I kick myself for that every single time because there were quite a few embers in there because it was a quarantine tank with like four or five honeys, and I think it was a, a group of green kubatai, and it was like, wow, that is amazing. Second floor says, uh, so glad we were able to enjoy your company. That would be mine. I'll live stream. <gasps> thank you well, very much. Thank you. Mac, thank um, you so much for the super chat. Wait, what? I wasn't finished. Okay. <clears throat> anyways as i was saying we miss you when you have to leave thank you i miss you too looking forward to seeing you and jason in dallas yeah that's right gonna and you're cool. gonna be there both days right yeah that's gonna be very cool i'm awesome. looking forward to it can't wait go ahead yeah. carry on Mac, thank you for the super chat two blue rams in quarantine one died from unknown reasons uh, for unknown reasons other is in my 65 gallon community tank but due to other fish it's at 25 c will this work at that temp so uh help me out matt 25 c is probably <clears throat> seven mid 70s 76 77 somewhere in there it's a little chilly uh, i i haven't had great luck with rams at typical tropical fish temperatures they really like that 82 83 even 84 so 77 okay good so i wasn't that far off um oh, I yeah. almost had. if you had to keep it there for a little while i maybe but i would try it at your first convenience to try to get that fish into a tank where it's going to be at least 82 you'll really see that thing perk up too because it's not like you put it at 77 it's just like oh my gosh it's, it's gone the next day that's not what happens. Usually what they do is they just kind of fizzle out over time. They, you know, they, they'll start out okay. Then you'll notice, oh, they're really not eating as much. And usually the dorsal fin is really erect. And then if it stays in that cooler temperature, you notice like, oh, it's kind of clamped up a little bit. And then all of a sudden one day you're like, huh, it's just not there anymore. These things don't live very long. But yeah. Kayla has that combo in oh, a, nice. in a, a 40 gallon. That's very striking, especially if it's a planted Beautiful. tank. Oh my gosh. The green, yeah. the orange, yellow. Yeah. Whoop. Local guy says, how many blue eye rainbows would you put in a 10 gallon? Oh, at least six to eight. Those are really tiny little fish. Um, we have some in quarantine. Right over there. Those okay. red, the red, little tiny red rainbows with the blue eyes. Oh. Yeah, look like the past guy. Yeah, those are Cuties. looking really good. Yeah, that's a great fish. Very nice fish. Patrick says, I wish we could have shrimp in New Zealand. So I'm assuming, I don't know much about New Zealand laws. But yeah, I'm but you have New Zealand and New Zealand. That's, yeah, and you have, if I lived in New Zealand, all I would do is go, I know. You shall not pass. And I would just be walking around in my, in my Gandalf. I would work on my beard a little bit more. I'd grow my hair out. I'd walk around in my robe. And I would literally just wander around there visiting all the places that were in Lord of the Rings. And I'd spend the rest of my life doing that. I would make my own personal little, um, uh, Shire. That's what I would do. Did you know, fun fact about Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien's, I think, grandson was actually in the movie. Wow. I didn't know this, but did you know that this, there was a dude that played both bad guys from one of the Hobbit movies, and I think he also played an orc? Yeah. He was, uh, it was crazy. Really? Yeah. So he was busy getting a lot of makeup. Yep. Switch well, here's a good off. question, Mark. What about pea puffers and half beaks together? I can see that working. Half beaks are almost oh. always going to stay at the top of the tank. They're very, very docile. 
I mean, they're both maybe, so googly eyed. Maybe the pea puffer would like be like, hey, I want to chase a half peak around. But man, when those things decide to shoot across a tank, they're like, pow, they're See gone. Pea puffer would get real sick of that in a hurry. So, oh my and gosh. the other thing too is That'd half beaks, fun. they love their, their live foods. Pea puffers wouldn't mind that as well. Pea puffers, of course, yeah. are going to eat the snails, but. Yeah, that, that, there's a, uh, well, okay, so the only the only thing, now that I think about it, <laughs> is you'd have to make sure the half beaks are, wherever your water parameters are, you just have to make sure that they're both kind of, that the water parameters are falling somewhere in the middle where their optimal water parameters are, because uh, sometimes those pea puffers, they like a little bit harder water. The half beaks sometimes are a little bit on the softer side, depending on, and some of them are a little bit more sensitive than others. That might be the only thing, but, other than that, I think it's okay. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll answer a couple more. And I like this one here. Nutty Dad says, what are the best plants for an Embuna tank to help lower nitrates? That's a great question. So I am unable, I've always been unable to keep plants, live plants. And then we've got the Embuna tank, the yellow lab tank with the slow side right over, uh, right there. Uh, and that's 75, no plants in there. But what I would do and what I have done is I've grown pothos out of the top of the tank. They generally leave this. So you just put the stem and let the leaves go onto the top of the of the lid. And it, they usually get enough light just from the fish tank light itself. And it will start to grow roots down. I found that for the most part, they leave the roots and the stems alone. But obviously the leaves can't go in the water. That's about all you can do. And then for people, of course, who have sumps, it's really simple because then they just grow their plants down in the sump and put a light down there. But most of us don't run sumps, but that's that's what I would do because they eat. They've pretty much destroyed everything else that I've ever put into a tank uh, that's green. All right, let me see here. I thought I saw something. See this thing? These these things are never they're not synced today. It's really aggravating me. All the chats. Really? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, as you says, love Lord of the Rings and Hobbit. I have a really hard time picking my top favorite, favorite movie series of all times. It's Lord of the Rings slash Hobbit. And then I've got the original Star Wars. The original Star Wars, meaning episodes Clear four, winner. five, six, which I absolutely love, especially because I remember them as a kid. So there's like a sentimental thing there. But I, I think the Lord of the Rings and Hobbits are a better story more interesting to watch and all six of those movies were outstanding as opposed to star wars where episode the original three were great the uh, episodes one two and three they got better as the episodes went on but they still weren't all that good and then whatever came out after that was for me unwatchable so yeah they're both <laughs> new friends says token over star wars this is an ongoing argument in my home <laughs> oh boy i, I know it <laughs> It, it, yeah, I mean, it's tough. It really is. It's I like them both. All right, everybody, on that note, now that you can go debate that with yourselves and <laughs> family members, uh, we are going to call it a night because it's about that time. Thank you. Thank you to all the moderators that were here helping out yeah. tonight and for all the great questions and the super chats and, and the gifted memberships. Really appreciate all of that always. And we will be back next Wednesday, same time, same place, right? There's nothing going on next Wednesday. I don't know why I was thinking there would be, but there's not. So we will be back. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And check out the top five schooling fish that Joanna came out with on her channel, The Small Scape, today. And see how it compares to mine and let us know what you think. So thank you so much. And we will see you next week. Bye -bye, night. Everybody. Night.